conversation with uh, Julian Thompson, the head of design for Jaguar, who's uh, also locked down like the rest of us, and we are talking to him from home. Uh, Julian, thanks for uh, talking to us at Autocar India. Uh, straight off, the question everyone would ask before they start is, uh, how's the lockdown been uh, treating you? And, uh, you know, uh, is this an opportunity to get your creative juices flowing at home when you're alone? You don't have to, you know, you don't have people around you and you have some quiet time to think as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's it's been going for over a month for us now. And uh, the trouble is we, we're doing meetings online like this and they've been probably a little bit too successful, you know. It's, I'm amazed how many hours I spend actually in meetings. Um, but there is there is more time for reflection. I think... What is good for us, you know, we've been very, very busy um, in our new studio. And sometimes you don't have enough time to sit back and just reflect about, you know, why you're doing something or, you know, what it's about and, you know, what you're really trying to create. And for us, you know, the Jaguar brand going forward, you know, it's a big challenge for us. We're, we're sort of at the crossroads a little bit now. You know, I think even before this crisis, there were... Um, several big challenges coming up. You know, there's, a, there's a, a, things like electrification and uh, connected cars and uh, autonomous cars. The world is really changing. So we're already we were thinking about, you know, what's going on. But this crisis really makes us now think more about how people are reacting to the whole world. You know, the whole issues of personal mobility, whether it's, it's um, the work-life balance, you know, what they consider to be a measure of success or, you know, security or all these things that are coming to, to out of the background now, you know. So against a lot of the technology, technology changes we're looking at, we're really going to, I believe, see a big change in people's attitudes going forward about transportation and luxury cars. So, that, you know, that it's all coming together in a very, very reflective time for us. So, uh, you know, but that, that's interesting. But do you think that would have some impact on the design direction uh, going forward? You know, the whole COVID crisis? Or do you think it will just eventually when people get confidence and hopefully there might be a vaccine, it will just come back to normal? Or do you think there's some things which are irreversible on the, in the way people view cars and even view certain brands, uh, you know, in the future? I think, I think there are two parts to that question. You know, there's, there's the first part, which is about... Um, you know, about I think people are are, seeing, are liking the fact there's little pollution around now. They're, they're seeing cleaner air, they're seeing open roads, they're seeing less traffic. They're they're, they're living in clearer skies. You know, they're, they're they're seeing a different world. You know, the world is the world has woken up. You know, and so I think this is a big opportunity for obviously electric cars, and probably smaller cars as well. You know, I think and people perhaps will they. Will they travel so much? We're going, to, we're going to see a bit of a backlash initially where people are going to avoid public transport and go back into cars as a very good escapist. But once, there's a, once we're over the threat of the virus, um, I'd hope people will remember this time of, of, you know, of better health, of cleanliness, and look more to electric cars and perhaps smaller cars. I think the other element for us is, you know, Jaguar is a luxury car brand. It, it, it's something which is is something special you buy, you know, as, as a reward for yourself, for your family. And we have to think about what is people's attitude to success, success and status and, you know, um, how does that manifest itself in the Jaguar brand? Do, do, we, do we want to do a big flashy car? Do we want to, are people going to come out of this and want to spend, spend, spend? Or do they want something which is something a bit more personal and a bit more, uh, yeah, a bit more of a human brand, really. So that's what we, we have to think how we communicate what we're about. Well, that's interesting. But, you know, the two things uh, which I want to pick up on what you said is that, you know, uh, this, this whole crisis, uh, it might change uh, people's mindsets. They've reflected on it towards electrification and even smaller cars because people will maybe, you know, travel a lot less and just travel when they need to. For a brand like Jaguar, I mean, are there opportunities in, let's say, small uh, electric cars um yeah i mean i think uh you know i i don't like the way necessarily the world way it's been going into bigger and bigger and bigger suv vehicles you know i mean i think i think cars have gotten too big you know and i think uh you know, you know they they I know they're very, very practical and people like, you know, the security aspect of them, but I think cars have just 
to me have just grown too big you know that and as you know they're taking up too much road space and and you know the the way they are is you know they, there's a lot of modern cars look very threatening as well and I, and I and i would i would like cars i would like to return to see smaller cars and more suitable for people's lives and fits better with them and um i think people will be looking for more energy efficient cars at the moment um electric cars give you almost like a a, a uh a ticket out of jail because you know I'm, I'm good for the environment because an electric car and it doesn't matter if it's an electric car it has a battery the size of an airport it's fine it's electric you know but i think as people go forward they want electric cars which are more efficient you know and understand when people start to understand the whole energy footprint of a vehicle i hope more efficient electric cars will, will come to the fore and i think these vehicles don't need to be um uh for jaguar don't need to be compromise any of our traditional values of luxury performance or aesthetic i think we can do some beautiful luxurious smaller vehicles right yeah all right julie i want to talk to you about the design studio which uh, you know your, your your massive facility which uh, you know, was inaugurated last year i was there for it uh must be a bit frustrating that you you can't be there and, and really you know use it to the fullest but how has it changed uh, things at uh, jaguar in terms of design uh, can you be a lot faster to market? I mean, is it in terms of uh, life cycle measures? Are you a lot quicker? Can you do a lot more? I mean, is, is it even more cost efficient in certain ways? How has it changed, uh, you know, things at Jaguar, especially for the future? Yeah, I, th I think for us, you know, as you know, as I spoke about before, you know, that we are at, a, at the crossroads, you know, the whole motor industry is at the crossroads, but Jaguar particularly, you know, with myself coming in with my team, you know, it gives us a chance to really, you know, Press a bit of a reset button and have a look. So what we've been doing in the past few months is really experimenting, if you like, what the boundaries of the brand can be. You know, uh, with greatest respect to Ian Callum, who's a good friend of mine and remains a good friend of mine. You know, we were on a certain philosophy and a certain path. And, you know, now is a time against a changing backdrop and perhaps with me coming in to really start afresh, you know. So... We are more efficient, we are more cost effective, all those great things. But what it means for us is that we can do a lot more variations, a lot more different uh, creative proposals of where the brand can go. So rather where before you could do, you know, one or two models for a certain vehicle proposal, now we can do five, you know. So we, in terms of creative variations and creative versions and, and uh, different proposals, we have a lot, of, a lot more great, uh, a lot more creative freedom. We have on-plate milling as well. So in terms of our interface from digital into manual clay models, it's absolutely seamless. You know, we can just go backwards and forwards, literally in feet of the computer. We can cut things. A designer can see them uh, straight away. The engineers can take the data off them. You know, we're really, really succinct in that process. Uh, and, uh, you know, just uh, uh, you talked about Jaguar being at a crossroads. Uh, you know, what does that mean in terms of design? Are we going to see a more of a revolutionary approach? Because so far, you know, it's been more revolutionary, even, you know, XF, XE, very similar. Uh, is this, you said, to press the reset button. So are we going to see a completely uh, different, uh, how would I say, even a different design language going forward, which kind of embraces future uh, customers, uh, you know, more towards ele electrification, that sort of thing. Are we going to see a complete, as I said, an overall in the design language? I, I think myself and uh, Ian Callum over the last uh, 20 years, you know, we, we, we came to a place in the brand where it played too much in its past and, and its, its design language, if you like, had got, had got a little bit stuck. So the job we've been doing over the past few years has been to make the brand very modern and very contemporary and also add a lot of new models to the range, you know, the, the three crossovers were all new, um, you know, another sedan. We brought in all these new cars, really. So we've had a period of great expansion and consolidation of the brand, you know, to, to really get it to the size we want it to be. Tremendous, one of the fastest growing luxury brands out there. So we, we've done that now. But our next challenge, against all the technical challenges I talked about, is, for me, I feel, is to, to bring back more of that Jaguar identity. We're seeing lots and lots of new brands from uh, places like China, but also startups in America. So a lot of activity in all sorts of markets, you know, a lot of strong competition, particularly from the Germans for us. Um, it's very, very important that we establish a very, very strong 
Jaguar identity going forward? Because, you know, for a brand like Jaguar, all that history and all that great story, that great history book, that great romance that exists for it, you know, we really want to build on that. And that's what our customers want. They want to build into that story, be part of that, you know, that exclusive club. So, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be turning up the wick on Jaguar. You know, it needs to be more and more Jaguar going forward. More exceptional cars, more creativity, more innovation, more beauty. That's interesting. But, you know, from our, from our design sense, uh, Julian, I just want to press you a bit on, I mean, how much more Jaguar than Jaguar can be right now? I mean, you know, you, your cars, to be honest, they do still have a lot of the Jaguar DNA. You know, they are taut, they are muscular, they are light, they're very elegant. Uh, you know, the grill is again quite synonymous uh, with what the Jaguars are, or at least the modern Jaguars for a while. So where do you think you can, uh, let's say, you know, uh, push a bit further or kind of, you know, let's say, uh, tighten or, or amp the Jaguar brand up a bit in design? Well, I think, uh, you know, for our period of expansion, we've, we've gone into some very competitive vehicle segments, particularly with the sedans, you know, with the XC and the XF, but also in the crossovers, the E-Pace and the F-Pace. You know, those are very uh, carefully controlled segments in the market. You know, everyone has the, the entry point into those brands, you know. Um, but, you know, I'd like our cars to stand out more, you know. I'd like them to be more different than, than they are at the moment. We have some very good entries. I think all the cars I've mentioned there are the best looking cars in their segments. But I would like them to be just a little bit well, a lot more differentiated going forward. So I'd like the interiors to be more special and I'd like the cars to perhaps uh, look even more beautiful. And I'd like them to, 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 to in terms of the way they drive, I think they should be always, they all should be always be about driving and they should be cars which you really enjoy driving and experiencing. So it's all just turning all those things up there. We have some very good, very credible entries in the market, but, you know, I want to make them better and, you know, more more identifiable and more different. So uh, would it be fair to say, like, you know, just being specific, let's take XC and XF uh, going forward with future generations. What you're saying is you'd like to see even more differentiation between these uh, product lines, because right now, quite frankly, they, they do follow a very common look and have that, you know, the, the, the a typical Jaguar family look right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the you know, the market for vehicles like BMW 3 Series and 5 Series and Audi, uh, a4 and A6, you know, it's it's very carefully controlled, and particularly in Europe, it's it's very much a business car market and fleet car markets. You know, so the the uh, the rationality of those products is really carefully controlled by that customer base. Um, I would like our cars to be, a, you know, be more distinctive than those marketplaces. So I want to I want to take away from the center ground and do things which are a little bit more exotic, if you like. So I, I think we've got some very credible entries into those those marketplaces, but then they're not different enough, you know. And I don't want to keep, I don't want to keep chasing the pack, you know. Um, you know, Jaguar is about innovation. It should be about leading. It should be setting the pace. And we don't want to. I, I get, uh, I get, you know, uncomfortable about just trying to pitch directly against those cars. I don't think we should be doing that. And, and to be honest, uh, Julian, do you think even given the scale of Jaguar, the numbers, uh, you know, exclusivity and differentiation is even more of a key because, uh, uh, you know, Jaguar just doesn't have even the scale of, let's say, some of the competitors. So is, is that something that kind of even drives this point further of, you know, you've got a lower volume based on a lot of competition and which means the need to stand out is even, even that much uh, more? Yeah, I mean, you're quite right. I mean, the fact that they are rarer and more exclusive should by definition make them more special you know that should be our advantage so our advantage is that you know we don't have to build hundreds and thousands and lots of territories and satisfy everyone we we don't need to build an average vehicle we can always build a special vehicle and also by virtue of our company being smaller you know we can react quicker to market forces we can react yeah. quicker to customer tastes we could be more agile so we can we can be more attuned to what's going on. So again, it comes down to luxury brands like our own, you know, setting people's desires and future tastes. That's what we want, where we want to be. And uh, uh, you know, uh, Julian, I want to talk about the, the the customer of the future. Let's talk about the millennials, which is really a bane for a lot of uh, companies yeah. or you know, consumer. They're very they're very challenging. They they they've got an attention span of maybe fifteen seconds. 
They're not very yeah. brand, brand loyal. Uh, they don't go into the depth of the product, uh, you know, very superficial. They want gizmos, connectivity. I mean, is this a challenge for uh, designers and, you know, even car makers as a whole? Because uh, you've got this new breed of consumers who want kind of, I would say, instant gratification. You know, they're not looking at the real depth uh, of the product. Um, it depends how you view the whole digital picture, really, and how you you uh, view the whole situation of connectivity you know it's it's you know you've got to have all of that that stuff there that's got to be at their fingertips you've got to have completely seamless integration of of your uh you know uh of your phone and all your me devices and all your social networks it's got to be into the car and it's got to be absolutely accessible and easy to use you know so that's 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 just a given you know you have to do that i think um looking beyond that talking about brands um Brands probably have a greater role to play. You know, they want as as brand people. You know, a lot of these millennials are very suspicious of big brands, big companies, and what they do. So, in terms of what we do as a company, in terms of what we um, associate with ourselves, what we our actions, you know, how we produce our cars, you know, uh, what we do, the collaborations we might do with other companies, you know, the materials we use. They all have to be very, very responsible and fitting in with, with these millennials. You know, our greater purpose, if you like, what we, what we mean as a brand, what we, we do as a company is very, very important. So that association is important, but it's also a great um, lever for us to be associated with these millennials. You know, they want, they want companies whose values you know, they respect. People are more and more suspicious of politicians. They don't associate with political movements anymore. They like to associate with brands. You know, that's where they really, really can understand, you know, seek an alliance and behavior and what they do and can express themselves through brands. So it's very, very important for us that we, you know, we connect these millennials and we, we do the right thing. We have a new research organization in, in Warwick, the NAIC, uh, which, you know, looks a lot at a lot of these uh, past, these uh, these these up and coming trends and, and what we're doing, we're doing a big piece of work about how millennials are going to react after COVID nineteen, and so it's right at front of mind. And also, we employ enough of them, and you know, as annoying as they are, you know, <laughs> they do have a very good view of the, of the world going forward, and probably we can learn a lot from them as well. And you know, again. Uh, Talking about future customers and, uh, you know, the push towards EV, which you said uh, the realization uh, that, uh, you know, the environment has benefited from cars, uh, you know, the wheels literally uh, are not turning anymore and, 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 you know, fewer cars on the road or no cars on the road has had a direct impact on uh, emissions and the environment. Do you think going forward with EVs, which are, you know, going to become more mainstream, where do you think the design direction is going to go? Because... Clearly, you don't have the uh, uh, the big lump of an engine. You don't have a drive line. You have a lot more flexibility. Or do you think people are still going to want traditional three box and two box shapes? Or do you think we could even see some mono volume shapes going forward? Really, super futuristic. Yeah, I mean, I think we don't have a big lump of an engine anymore. But we have a big lump of the battery. <laughs> so it's just uh, you know, you have something else you have to yeah, package. Yeah, but the battery it can be packaged. I mean, it's quite flexible. You can uh, you know package it's, it's it. It's not. A, it's Perhaps at the moment it's not as flexible as you thought it might be. It's still at the moment the battery is very very big, it's very very heavy, and it's very very expensive. And it's um, at the moment you know they're not as modular as, as we'd perhaps like. And it's something so heavy, you know, you want to put it as low and as centrally and, and possible the car to the closest to central gravity as you can. So um, that is making cars taller, you know, and uh, that's something designers. Uh, particularly Jaguar designers don't like, yeah. so <laughs> so uh, we have to wrestle with that as well. Uh, the motors are getting bigger as well as they, you know as we learn more about those. So it's still it's still an, an ongoing uh, it's an ongoing thing. I guess also to answer your question, um, a mono volume car could be an idea, could be an interesting thing to do. Um, cars can't necessarily be mono volume because you know, they need a lot of crash structure in front of them. Right. So um, to actually position a driver at the front of the very, very heavy car, which is an electric car, and crash it is really, really difficult, you know, because you've got that big battery and you have to put all the crash structure in front of the battery. So to actually have a monovolume, which implies putting the driver towards the front of the car, is, is difficult. So what we call that the occupant to the front of the car in terms of distance, we don't see that changing a great deal. 
So uh, the other thing is, so we talk about the position of the of the volume of the body as well. We probably can get you know, electric cars. The big batteries mean longer wheelbases. Longer wheelbases mean what we call a longer couple. The, the, the first and second row seats are further apart. So you can get you can get big cabins as well. Against all of those things I've said, you know, you've got to think: Is there a best aesthetic for a car? You know. Yeah. If, what is the best if, aesthetic? Yeah. So if if I designed a cab for Jaguar E type, would you like it as much? No. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> that's what you've got to think about. So that's so those are the things you got to. So you've got to balance against you know the beauty of a Jaguar and the aesthetic design of it is right at the top of the list of everything we do. Right. And you know that's that's what we're going through. So we work very close with our engineers to make sure the the the. Uh, engineering components under the cars, you know, within the flexibility of what we've got, go exactly where we want to, to, to go. So all sorts of subtle things about, you know, these electric vehicles you've got to get right and, you know, and, and so it's very, very important. You can't merely do a cab forward vehicle and say it, it's modern because, it, you know, that's what a van looks like or an MPV, you know. But right. a cab forward vehicle... Those are getting the aesthetic sense, yeah. Yeah, if you did a cab forward vehicle with a very low cowl, if you like a very low windscreen, that is modern. So the things go hand in hand. So, you know, we've got a wrestle of all these different bits and pieces, you know. Um, but, you know, um, just yourself question, you know, what is, what is, is uh, it's the same where you have a beautiful building or a beautiful person or a beautiful car. Sometimes the same characteristics always win through. Uh, Julian, you know, you know, coming uh, again to what I want to talk about is, um, uh, design trends going forward or more than that life cycle management and life cycles. Do you mm -hmm. see life cycles maybe now getting a bit longer? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the way the economies are all over the world, people aren't buying cars that frequently life cycles are being extended. And do you see a trend towards maybe a longer mm -hmm. life cycles, but uh, you know, more, more frequency of life cycle measures like facelifts, maybe, uh, you know, not just a midlife facelift, but you know, sometimes, uh, uh, maybe two, three facelifts along the way, which are small interventions, don't cost too much, but keep the product fresh going forward. And especially for low volume manufacturers like y'all, where you really need a, a real long life cycle to make the investment pay off over the long production run. Um, I think, you know, I'd always encourage people to keep cars. You know, I've got lots of old cars myself, you know, which I've received from the scrap heap. Um, and you know the most the most uh, you could say the greenest thing you can do the most environmentally sound thing to do is to just buy one car and keep it forever you know um, but at the same time you know this is against a transition to electric at the moment the industry is really struggling with this transition from um, ice cars through to hybrids through to EVs you know and um, engineering wise as you know people are trying to make the decision about do they develop very expensive what we call vehicle platforms or architectures which can do both but perhaps both versions are slightly compromised because of the other versions right. they have to accommodate or do they go the whole hog and go to a full electric car but knowing yeah, against all of this yeah. that the world is changing and, and the battery technology will change and will get better and better and better so i think it's going to take a while we're going to we're going to have a very awkward phase uh, for car manufacturers where they try to manage this transition into electric vehicles and how quickly it would come. And the frustration for the industry is, you know, it's not very clear about what the customers want to actually be. And it's not down to just customers, it's down to regulations. You know, taxation, uh, banning cars, into, uh, uh, petrol cars into cities, all these things are being talked about. And governments, you know, make decisions based on, you know, who's in power that week, you know, and they, they set forth an agenda. And a lot of environmental grandstanding also. I mean, you know, it's, yeah. it's cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so imagine us you know, on the other side of the fence is the industry, the car industry like us, who have to invest billions into architectures, which we want to last for sometimes uh, seven, maybe 15 years on an architecture. And we're trying to bet the farm on that. So we've got to place a bet against that. And against that, you've got to look at all the different territories, you know. North America is probably going to be very different to Europe in terms of adoption of electric vehicles. And so it's really difficult thing for us to manage to, to, to get that right. And particularly when, you know, uh, against an economic pressure, we're going to be suffering post COVID-19, which is always getting just, it's just getting more and more harsh. 
Yeah, so I, and I think clearly the way forward in that scenario is probably collaboration. I think it's very difficult to, for automakers to be on their own given the, the investment that's needed in so many. You, know, you have to can't just put all your eggs in one basket. You've just got to be betting on several te technologies and scenarios and markets. And I think to do that alone, possibly collaboration is going to be the way forward. Yeah, I think so. But it depends how you collaborate. You know, it's, you, you can collaborate on componentry or parts. Or you can collaborate on the whole architectures or you can actually buy each other out. It depends how it is, you know. Uh, for Jaguar and Land Rover, you know, our strength has always been our strong identity and the fact we're very, very different. And so, right. uh, you know, we've got to get real. You're right about that. You know, there's economic issues and economic pressures for us to take care of. But at the same time, you know, our identity and, and what we mean to the customer, you know, we're in a good place for that. We've got to maintain that. Right, yeah. So the sense I get, uh, Julian, is that, you know, identity is going to be uh, what's going to really, uh, it, it, that's going to be the future. To develop that sharp identity, to keep that aspiration, to keep that desirability, and obviously have the pull on the product just from a pure, pure aesthetic design and brand sense. Because, uh, you know, the, the cost for that, or let's say what people would pay a huge premium for that, which you, could, uh, which you need to kind of develop uh, more and more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the way for us as well. You know, we've got, we got to be different. You know, we've got to be very individual. You know, there's a, there's a real love for the Jaguar brand, you know, which is, you know, very historical, based on some very very uh emotional if you like cars reconnect with your heart you know and um that's what we want to continue to go forward doing in a electric world or a post-covid 19 world or in a millennial world it's very very important that emotional connection to the vehicle is which is what defines us yeah and uh, 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 lastly uh, julian a little bit about yourself i know you're talking evs we're talking about the future but you yourself you know are quite a a car nut, uh, I think even a classic car nut. I mean, what's, let's say, what's your dream garage typically? What would you love to have? I mean, I, I mean, I'd, I'd love driving and I think, uh, you know, I miss driving. You know, I really, uh, you know, uh, I, I live in an area where I can drive my, my cars fairly well. And uh, I've always, I've always been into, into cars. I've always been into that experience of driving cars. And, you know, and I've, I've always been a big car fan, you know, the real petrol head. Um, I have two Jaguars. I have two SBR Jaguars, which are, you know, incredibly fast, beautiful cars, really the pinnacle of our brand, an, an F-Pace SBR and an F-Type SBR. Um, I have an old Ferrari I bought when, in, when I'm just out of college, actually, in 1984. I bought an old Ferrari, which I still have now. And then I have a few of the cars I've designed in my career, such as an old Lotus, uh, Something as mundane as a, as a which, which, which Ferrari is it? I mean, is it a is it a 308 or? It's a 246 Dino. Oh wow, 246. Okay, so it's an old there. Lovely. Yeah, yeah. So I have that, and then and I have a, a Lotus. And a beautiful and a, car. Yeah, and then I have a Lotus Elise, and uh, a couple of hot hot hatchbacks. I'm very keen on. I, I love you know driving on cars and track track days and things like that. And a Subaru Impreza, just you know, just things to mess around with. So I, I you know, I love all those cars, and I, I, I love all those old vehicles. And uh, I guess I'd like to buy, I'd love to buy a Jaguar XK120 next, is the thing I'd like. But they're they're so expensive. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Julian, thanks for talking to us, and uh, let's hope you know you can uh, have a chance to drive all those cars, all your cars, uh, like we all used to. I think you know these are very challenging times for us, but. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the, we are all hopeful of uh, better times ahead and uh, wish you all the best and looking forward to some really exciting cars. And I think what you've given us a clue is that we're going to see some really desirable Jaguars coming out of your studio, which are going to be looking quite different, uh, quite aspirational and very desirable. So here's looking forward to that. And thanks, uh, thanks a lot for talking to us. Yeah, thank you so much. Great talking to you. Thanks very much. And good thank luck. You.